And today we have Fawn Clark Peterson, who is an adjunct here um, in specifically the 3D studio arts and ceramics. Um, but she's an adjunct at almost uh, what four other institutions or something. It depends on the term. <laughs> yeah, it depends on um, what is uh, really great about our community of artists is, you know, I met Fawn, um, we we're in Aurora on the... Uh, Public Arts Commission. Public Arts Commission. That's what it was. Yeah. And I was just like, I would always show up late and unorganized and everything. Um, and Afon was uh, always on time, keeping notes and making everything run there uh, and always had something interesting to say. And I had no idea that she was a ceramicist. Um, and so we started talking about it and we had a, a job opening at ECC and, you know, because of where we're at now with the enrollment and whatnot, we weren't able to get her in, in ceramics this particular semester, but she is a great uh, ceramics teacher. So if you're interested in taking another art class, she would be an awesome person to um, to look up and see when she Definitely. has a class scheduled. Um, it be fun, I promise. Yeah, it is fun with Fawn. It's always fun with Fawn. Um, in the future, we're gonna have uh, a printmaking artist who's uh, who taught at ECC a few years back named Aaron Coleman. We have a sculptor uh, named uh, Catherine Jacoby, who is based out of Chicago. She's also a graphic designer. Um, and then we also have uh, Jasmine Clark, who was a photo adjunct at ECC for a little bit. And she's based out of Chicago as well. Um, so keep an eye out for those. And uh, we'll be sure to make sure that you guys all know. And we'll, again, post it on this website. Um, so fun. Uh, if you guys haven't looked her up, you should. Her work is pretty awesome. Uh, the website is, do you mind if I share it, Fawn? Not a bit. All right. Although I have most of the stuff in the talk today. Well, I just want to let them know what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You know, for when I post all that new work I'm making. Hey, hey, hey. Keep it down, keep it down. All right, are you guys seeing, I don't know if you guys can see Fawn Clark Peterson website. Thumbs up somewhere. All right. So um, fawnclarkpeterson.com. Uh, it's pretty interesting uh, to see, Fawn, that you do a wide variety of work. And I only know you of the ceramicist, <laughs> as the ceramicist. And I forgot to bring it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, and I'm going to give it to you, Fawn, in a bit. Um, a few years ago, I bought a mug at a, a, a pottery sale, and I really liked it. And um, I was in a meeting with Fawn and I looked at the bottom of this mug when I, I got done drinking my coffee and I realized that it had her name on it and I didn't even know her. So I had bought her, I loved her artwork before I even knew her and then it all came together and I was like, oh, this is awesome. And it is probably the most comfortable mug to drink coffee out of that I own. So uh, on that note, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna let you take over Fawn and you should have uh, the ability to uh, go ahead and take over the screen. Okay. Do what you need to do. All right, um, there we go. Y'all can see it. it, says my name, Elgin Community College. Yes. Are we good? All right. Uh, so I, I really wish I could be coming to you from the studio and covered in mess like is my natural state but here we are living in zoom land uh so we'll be we're zoom landers how about that uh we'll be doing the best we can with what we got so i put together kind of a slideshow for you guys today um that's going to go through sort of how i got to be in art and art history because i kind of had one foot in each realm um and then how i specifically got to clay uh people and things who have influenced me uh, and then my work, focus, sort of development from there. Uh, so off we go. All right, how I got into art in art history. 12 years of Catholic schools, went from St. Mike's on the right to St. Francis Plaid on the left. Uh, I didn't get along with any of that stuff. Um, barely graduated high school. Uh, 
by the grace of two teachers, I got through. And then when I went to college almost by accident. I, I kind of didn't know what else to do. Uh, but I'd always been good at art. And I was always in art classes. You know how when like you're, you like whatever you're good at. So uh, I liked art. It came easy to me, so I did it. Um, I never had music because my parents always had me in art classes. But so I went to college for art. Um, but after being such a poor student my whole life, uh, as I was taking my gen ed courses, I started taking classes with uh, this really fabulous history professor who taught the history of Christianity, but he was a cranky old Jewish man. So uh, I got a completely different perspective. And uh, for the first time in my life, it was not only allowed for me to think for myself, but it was demanded of me. Uh, and I found out that not only was I not bad and dumb, I was kind of smart. <laughs> uh, so I kept taking history courses. I really, really loved it. Oh, shoot. Sorry, my lamp just tipped. Nice. So I kept taking history courses, and I really love research, and I really love uh, the historical record and uh, inferring things from material culture and finding out why things happen, not just what happened. Um, and I ended up with a history degree. I didn't get my art degree. I only had a minor in art just because once I'd been there for four years, I had more credits in history than art. And I'd been doing it the whole time and enjoyed it, but um, I sort of, I didn't really find my niche as an undergrad in art. Like I, I was, I did a lot of 2D. Um, and whenever I was drawing, I wanted to be painting. And whenever I was painting, I desperately wanted to be drawing. So it was this, I didn't find my place. Uh, so I graduated with history and what do you do with a BA in history? I was a really overqualified administrative assistant <laughs> for about 13 years. Um, and during that time, I, well, I took a very convoluted route to where I'm at, but uh, during that time I did a lot of traveling. Traveling is my other major passion. I love going places. Uh, and finding myself in completely unfamiliar surroundings and just sort of learning that way. Uh, if you ever go to a new city, get on a bus. Get on a bus and take it until you have no idea where you're at. Get off, walk around, and try and find your way back. That's a great way to see a city. Really great way. Um, so uh, I'm working in an office, traveling a lot. Because it paid pretty well, but it was not making me happy. So I decided to go back to school. Uh, for a graduate degree and uh, in this odd little noggin, it seemed, I don't know, more responsible to go for art history than art. I thought I'll combine my art and my history and go for art history. I want to, uh, I want to know everything that Indiana Jones knows, but I don't want to run in the desert or have people shoot at me. That was sort of my, my goal. Um, and after a few years of that, I have uh, a tremendous amount of work done. Um, I kind of wasn't finding my niche there either, although I loved the subject and uh, everything I was studying. I wasn't sure that I really wanted to spend my life writing books on the subject uh, and arguing with other people over things that I didn't care that much about. Uh, so, and it just so happened that right about that time, we were remodeling a kitchen in our first condo, my husband and I, and uh, was in Anybody know what Expo is? Juan's shaking his head. A lot of you might be too young. It was, I don't think they're around anymore. It was a really high end, like kitchens to walk around in and really high end fixtures and tiles. And I found myself looking at uh, some tiles that were, I don't know, 60 or $90 a square foot, uh, thinking, I can do better than that. <laughs> I can make that stuff. Um, so I, often do a ceramics class at NIU and uh, started doing some work on that and then started thinking about historical tiles, you know, bringing in that art history. Um, fell in love with is Islamic tile work. Um, and what I'd been studying mostly as a graduate student in art history was um, Hiberno-Saxon manuscripts, another ultimately practical like, region of knowledge. Uh, and 
that's where my love of clay really started. I, I never went back. From there, I uh, spent a couple years working up a portfolio to get into grad school for uh, a Master of Fine Arts in clay and uh, got in. I did it. Um, so things that influenced me, uh, overall, I think most of what I'm interested in is very organic in nature. Uh, not that I'm a nature freak. I don't really want to go around out in it too much. <laughs> I just want to make pictures. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Uh, but it's true, I guess. A little bit of nature is good, not too much. Yes, the, the way that clay naturally breaks. Um, incidentally, this also happens, I discovered, at the sewage treatment plant down the street. Uh, it's, they, they dry things and it cracks like this and it's totally disgusting, but also very beautiful. Um, uh, the, there's a repetition. Uh, anything with texture is of great interest to me. My husband gives me a hard time about uh, how embarrassed he is when we walk into a clothing store because I don't actually look at anything. I just walk around with my, oh, that feels good. What does it look like? Um, because that's more important because you got to wear it. And if it's uncomfortable, it doesn't matter how it looks, right? Uh, so he always makes fun of me for that. But texture, um, the rhythm that happens in nature and repetition um, and opposites. Anything that uh, is opposite and where those things meet is always of great interest to me. Um, so here we have these hard ancient stones. Uh, and yet the way they come together is very sort of rhythmic and soft. The, the, the edges round out. Those are beautiful. This is a piece of burl wood that uh, I've had this image on my screen for ages. It makes me really happy. I want to touch it. Uh, sometimes when I see a piece of um, pottery, like actual functional wear instead of sculpture, I can tell if it's a really great piece because I really want to not only just touch it, but I want to lick it. Ugh, it's just gorgeous. Stop looking at me like that one. It's true. Um, Yes, so burl wood, the, the fine, 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 fine lines, the thicker lines, it forms contour lines, it makes faces, it makes gestures, it's, it's just beautiful and wonderful. Another natural feature that I just find so much inspiration in is uh, Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. Has anybody ever seen that? It's on the north coast. Um, and a lot of tourists don't go up there because of the troubles they've had over the years, but it's really the most amazing place to be. Um, this is, uh, these columns are basalt. They crack naturally in this formation as the igneous rock comes up and cools. So they make these towers of stone uh, that go like, there's like these mountains and then it just sort of breaks off and looks like a stairway going down into the sea, which is why it's called Giant's Causeway. As the legend has, that's where the giants would come down and walk across the sea and go kick the butts of the Scottish giants on the other side of the, the channel. Uh, but these sort of octagonal pillars of stone that come up form this sort of beautiful pots that I love. There's another image of it. Isn't that cool? Um, Juan, how big are those, like, would you say? Um, do you mean tall or how wide are the columns? Um, they're like, I don't know, maybe between a, I'd say actually about two feet across, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. Uh, sometimes they're giant, giant's causeway. Uh, they're pretty phenomenal though. They're called basalt columns. Uh, and this isn't the only place they occur, but this is a really, um, stunning expression of it geologically. So some other things, this is a the pattern left by a puffer fish in the sand on the bottom of the ocean. It's elegant, it's, it's, it's part of their like mating ritual to the males do this, to attract the females. They make these lovely little mandalas. And outside of the natural world, even when we start to get into man-made things, um, this is something that blew my mind when I saw it the first time. It's, it's actually a, a a man-made stone wall from the 6th century BCE. There's no mortar in this and it's been up for like 7,000 years in an earthquake zone. 
uh, because they have these thick, thick stones and they literally cut them with irregular angles and edges and everything to fit perfectly together. Uh, so not only is it astounding, but it forms this beautiful pattern, not unlike Giant's Causeway. Uh, some more man-made things that, I you know Andy Goldsworthy, if any of you are familiar with him, is a big favorite. Um, the more organic something is, the more effortless it looks. I think the more I'm attracted to it. Uh, obviously, the last two things we've looked at have not been effortless. They've <laughs> taken great effort. But the way it comes off is so uncontrived seeming, so elegant in its simplicity, that that is what really inspires me. Uh, on to more man-made things. This is uh, the rotunda from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, repetition, light, pattern. Again, this is more contrived being man-made. Um, but again, technically stunning in that it was from the sixth century and this is a massive structure. It is massive. Uh, and it too has stood in an earthquake zone through wars, many, many wars, everything, and it's still there. It's there longer than the nations who built it and, and so many different things. Um, and incidentally, it was, uh, well, it started off as a Christian church and then it was a mosque and then it was a Christian church and then it was a mosque again, I think, before it became a museum. Uh, and it's been a museum for like the last 50 or 80 years. And just last month, was it last month, Amy? Do you hear about this? Um, they made it a mosque again, so it's no longer a place you can go like publicly just to see the amazing architecture. It makes me a little sad, but um, that rhythm, that cadence, that um, the sort of regularity with great variance, I guess, is the best way I can put it, that captures me. Uh, and it can be seen in all sorts of things. Um, this is just a little cuneiform tablet. It's not very big, but this big square, uh, those little uh, conical marks. Um, I find these older ones a little more pleasing than the newer ones that are more regular and angular. Uh, this almost looks like a pillow. But it's I, um, my art, uh, my art one, 151 students were looking at cuneiform this week and I have them actually trying it and so they've 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 kind of gone through like the meditative process of, of doing the slashes and the um, not we usually do it in clay when we're in the classroom but since we're virtual they're doing it on um paper and so this was good timing for, for cool. that. somebody yeah kiana just wrote we just learned about that it's so cool um so sorry that's cool. just like i said i wasn't gonna do i'm interrupting i'm muting myself. no i think that's great and actually when you said that i was just thinking um i've got an art of British class as well and Maybe I'll make them make some of that homemade Play-Doh to do it with. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, it would. Yeah. <laughs> Are any of your your those students in here who did it? Yeah. So I have a couple of. Um, do you want some questions? Is, should I? Should I? Should I? Do you want to sure, break not? it up? You want some questions? All right. Yeah. Let me let me curate some questions here. Hold on. Um, well, you on. read those. I'd be curious, you guys who are in that class. Would it would it drive you nuts to? To make the homemade play-doh to do this with or did you just like or would that be fun i don't want to I have, my art appreciation students are in here too and we do every week we do either a micro essay or a mini project so like next week they're making um egg tempera plate um paints at home and so we're we're doing they have an option to do something hands-on um so i think you guys chime in or do a thumbs up if you if you think it would be they seem to like making things is what i can what i can tell Nice. Um, okay, here's a question. Here's two questions together. Um, I understand you found your inspiration in natural and imperfect patterns. Who are some of your biggest influencers, which I think you're talking about already? And then um, does the city of Chicago inspire you and do you incorporate any natural aspects of the city or kind of like local landscapes? Um, I will talk about specific artists in just a few minutes that totally float my boat. Uh, as far as the city of Chicago, um, yeah, there's some amazing things here. If you've never been to the Oriental Institute, uh, since we're talking about uh, cuneiform right now, my God, go. It's like one of my favorite museums in the whole city. It's little, there's only like five galleries and you get to be so close to this stuff. Like you can walk right up to some of the winged bowmen of Babylon like, and say hey to them, like they're like right there. 
um, you can see mummified squirrels and snakes and like the coolest stuff there. And it's right there. And if you have kids, they have like grad students who like they'll, uh, they've recreated games that were found in uh, the, the Great Burial at Ur. Uh, so you, they'll teach your kids how to play, they think, how the board game went that they found in the, the burial there. That's super fun. Um, visually, uh, I'm a sucker for beaches. Like the lakeshore is uh, just the pattern that is in the sand from waves. Uh, the Oh, when the waves freeze, have you guys ever seen that? The, well, the water comes lapping up and it, it ever so gradually freezes, but it gets like viscous. And so sometimes you get like literally frozen waves. That is super cool. Or when the, um, the waves come and they shove, so when the water just starts to freeze over the top and uh, the waves push it onto land and then they keep doing that over and over. So you end up with like, it looks like, uh, it looks like ice baklava covering the shores. It's fabulous. <laughs> That's totally inspiring. There's lots of stuff. I mean, anywhere you look, there's going to be stuff if you're paying attention. Now um, we're all hungry and trying to like combine <laughs> baklava um, and ice. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna just say a quick word to my students. You guys are all like, there's so many of you here, and you're all asking great questions. If we don't answer your question, you will still get credit for asking it, and Fawn will answer it later if we don't get to everyone. So thanks, you guys. Yeah. And, um, so if we don't get to everything, I apologize. Um, and we'll let Fawn keep going and you guys will still, um, even if your question is not answered right now, um, it will be answered and Fawn will get to you. So, sorry, Fawn, go ahead. No problem. All right. Um, and like I said, one of my great passions is Hiberno-Saxon manuscripts. Um, they have rhythm and flow and power and, and visual texture and funny, funny faces like this guy. He looks so ornery. Um, and these things thrill me. All of it goes into what I make. It's funny. I, like, life is nothing if it isn't funny. It's ridiculous. You might as well laugh at the absurdity of it. Uh, so these things I love, they inspire me tremendously. Look at this one. Ha! This guy is great. He's got a little present and snakes holding a ball. And I love that, that it, this was such a precious piece. This was actually gold leaf that was uh, uh, burnished onto the surface. Um, books, books of this era were some of the bigger, biggest treasures that you could have. If you think about the fact that all of the pages in these books, which are Bibles, so they're not small books, and they're big, like this. Um, if you think about the number of pages and the fact that uh, the pages were made from hides, like, you'd have to kill a whole herd of cows to make a book. That's an expensive thing. And then come the jewels on the cover and all the gold leaf in it. And, you know, this is like a gift for kings. Um, yeah, I get really excited. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, so man-made inspirations, texture, uh, variance, repetition. This is the monastery uh, Osios Lucas in Greece. Um, this type of architecture from the Byzantine era is a huge influence on me as well, I think. Uh, it kind of looks like a pile. It's not fancy. A lot of people think like the, the giant cathedrals are like the piece de resistance. But I really, really love these smaller structures where they start out with um, this sort of rustic stonework uh, towards the base. And then as they move up, um, the bricks get more refined. Then comes the decorative elements where the bricks are turned uh, so it's corner out. So, you know, on those stripes, you're, you're getting texture, uh, the, the window pieces, literally different colors, and then the roof tiles on top, all of it uh, gives such a beautiful exterior to the piece. I mean, the, the building itself is a piece of art, not to mention what's inside of it. Uh, all right, so on to some artists who, who really, I mean, there's so many, I don't even know how to talk about the artists that have influenced me or that, that I can see in my own work or see their influence. So I, I picked a few of them. And the biggest one, I think, her name is Ruth Duckworth. Um, she worked in clay. She passed away not too long ago. Um, she was German originally and um, was sent away, like fled Nazi Germany and lost most of her family. She grew up mostly in England 
and then landed in Chicago as an adult. Um, she had a teaching gig at the University of Chicago. Uh, and so she taught there for a little while. She decided she didn't teaching, dealing with administration. That's ridiculous. She was way above it. So she left um, and uh, started her own practice. She reconfigured a pickle factory in the city so that she had uh, an apartment upstairs and downstairs. It was rough studio space and um, it was actually for sale after she passed away. So you could take a video tour of it and I would have given anything to have like a cool two million so I could have bought that place. But uh, alas, I did not. So this is Ruth. Um, and like me, she has a messy studio. So it's one endearing thing about her. Um, early days when I was working with Clay, I was still trying to find my way. Um, and I was taking classes at uh, College of DuPage uh, to be able to use their studio because I was kind of working on my own. I told you I was putting together a portfolio to get into grad school. Um, and the, the teacher out there showed us some slides, one of which was some work of Ruth Duckworth's. And it was like my whole head exploded. Like, I get it now. I get it. I know what I want to do. Uh, the way she married simplicity with elegance and uh, you know, some you know, her stuff is almost rude. At the same time, it's very, very quiet. Uh, she just blew my mind. That was on a Wednesday. On Thursday night after work, I got in my car and drove to Minneapolis to see her retrospective show. Um, because it was the last stop on the tour and I got to see it before it closed. Uh, but she's been a huge influence on me ever since. Um, and if I had to describe my own work, which you'll get to see in a few minutes, I promise, um, I would say that it is sort of a marriage between a, a Japanese concern for material with um, kind of a Northern European modernism, so that that organic and that very contrived, the, the combination of the two. I told you I like when two different things meet, that, that edge where they butt up to one another. Uh, but her work has a quiet elegance to it that I think is just, um, it's perfect. It's just lovely. Uh, this is not a fabulous image, but I do love this piece. I love the blush uh, as the um, copper is coming out of the glaze here. That's a really specialized film technique where you pull that color out. Uh, and she's also funny. She's hilarious. Look at these shapes. They're, they're ridiculous. They're, it's like Humpty Dumpty with long legs and some ridiculous witch with grouping anatomy. Uh, they're, she, they're just fun. Another person who who really uh, really curls my toes is Ruth Asawa. Um, and I have focused a little bit more on females than males here. I think I have some males later, but especially in the world of 3D, I think that uh, women kind of get the short end of the stick, especially uh, before you know mid 70s. Uh, then it starts to turn around, and we're getting there, but. Um, Ruth Asawa was really, um, you know, she, she was in a Japanese internment camp during World War II. Um, and she came out and made these amazing pieces where she took what is essentially, you know, crocheting, like a real, uh, well, that's, you know, a woman thing. Uh, but she did it with wire and she did it not necessarily in a traditional sense, but made these massive, like gorgeous sculptures and installations out of them. So taking what is a traditional medium and turning it on its head and doing something super cool with it uh, is kind of thrilling to me. Here's another uh, female artist uh, that came up during the 60s. Her name was Daisy Youngblood. Uh, found herself with kids, her husband left, she had to figure out a way to make a living. She knew some, some artists in New York and they encouraged her to start making some things. And she, uh, what I like about her work is it pays, it pays homage to the, the material so wholly. Like, this is very clearly, you know, like a, a, a big cat. Uh, but it's really just 
very simply torn clay. It's so beautiful and simple that it's almost, it's just undeniable. It's just, it's elemental, I guess is the way I would put it. These are the things, I, I, I seek things that are elemental, that are kind of like vanilla ice cream or black coffee. No fuss, just perfection, right? Uh, Giacometti, oh, talk about texture. Oh. <laughs> uh, totally new way of working with, with figures. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so mad that he beat me to it because I could work in that style. So I would love it so much, but he did it already. So I got to find something new. Uh, but he's definitely an influence. Uh, and not everything is 3D uh, that inspires me. Francis Bacon is one of those 2D artists that uh, blows my mind. But it's for some of the same reasons that I respond to 3D work. You know, this is a, a nice example of uh, texture and um, negative space is a big feature in most of the work that, that inspires me. He does really amazing things with negative space. In this case, he's working with geometrics and really organic textural lines all together at once. Uh, and it flows, they complement each other so beautifully. They, the, the two things just set each other off. Here's another example of that. You know, if, if he didn't have these really rigid uh, geometric features, in his negative space, this work wouldn't be nearly as cool. It would not, it wouldn't work as well at all. Uh, so the, I also like that he's really dark and twisted, I have to admit. I mean, that's just part of the course. I love that stuff. Um, and I thought, I just, just so no one thought I hate color because I've, you know, had mostly black and white things up. Um, I threw in some of these Byzantine mosaics because there are more things that just blow my mind. Uh, they're just like popping and sparkling and coming at you in your face. And there's the three wise men like running across the lawn in their, their 1980s spandex pants uh, that, that just thrill. You know, they even like thought to have the repetition of these palm trees in back with the repetition of the, the dates hang off. And then each one of them has a little plant between his legs and has little curly shoes on. Um, they're just all so fun. The color is beautiful. I don't tend to use a lot of color in my work. Uh, you know, like there's so much going on with form and texture anyway. In these cases, it kind of detracts from those things. Uh, maybe it could be that I'm just not good enough yet to juggle all those balls at once, but I really appreciate the focus of uh, a limited color palette. And so that's kind of why I keep uh, my pieces a little quieter in terms of hue. But that's not to say I don't respond to Hugh in a, a serious way. So on to my work. You guys have sort of seen a lot of, of what goes into my thought process and things. I don't do a lot of functional work, but you know, pretty much anyone who's in ceramics does some. Uh, because the first thing anyone says when they hear you're in ceramics, hey, make me a mug. Uh, so I have I I, I really love making functional work, but at the same time, it's very repetitive. Um, and I, I don't sit still very well. I get bored very easily, so I need to move on and move on. So usually what I go is like maybe once a year, I'll sit down and make a lot of it the last week. You know, if someone wants to buy it for gifts, um, I have it on hand. Uh, in fact, my stock is just about out, so I need to get to work. <laughs> but this is, um, this is sort of my typical style of working. Uh, in terms of functional work. Um, the same things are at play here, though, as in the sculptural work and the things that uh, really inspire me. Um, this is a red, rough, super groggy clay, meaning there's like chunks of pre-fired clay in it. It's a rough clay. Um, uh, a matte, or not matte, but satin black. And then this, um, this white glaze on top of it, which it just occurred to me, is actually a recipe I found that is purportedly one of Ruth Duckworth's glaze recipes. Um, this doesn't mean anything to anyone except people like me, but it was like, oh, really? <laughs> um, and the way it breaks is very organic. 
it looks random, it looks uncontrived, but I can tell you that over the years I've found ways of, um, you know, I'm not making uh, representative images with it or anything, but I'm definitely in control of uh, where it breaks with small holes and where it breaks with big bubbles and where it's a little bit softer like here, where it's more of a halo versus where it looks like moon craters. Um, I'm going to stop you right there. There was a question that I think fits in good here. Okay. Um, what do you do when a piece you're working on doesn't go the way you want it to go? How do you handle, you know, the clay or the glaze? Um, you know, how much do, do the, the question is, what do you do when a piece isn't going the way you want it to, to be going? Well, I usually swear really loud and throw it at the wall. Oh, sometimes that happens. Um, sometimes not. Sometimes uh, if it's not going the way you want it to, it's important to notice the way that it is going uh, because happy accidents lead to breakthroughs if you follow them very often. Uh, and clay definitely has a mind of its own. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute because that's one of the things I love most about it. Uh, working with clay is, uh, it's a lot like working with kids. Like, you can tell them what to do until you're blue in the face, uh, but you'll be a very unhappy parent if you just keep trying to hammer a square peg into a round hole. Uh, clay has a mind of its own and you need to learn what its tendencies are and then sort of work with it. You don't demand things of it, you ask things of it. It's kind of like, um, what's that sport where they have the brooms and the big rocks? Curling. Her curling, curling, one of those where they a big stone and they slide it down the ice and they're in front of it, like doing the ice in different ways to make it slow down or turn. It's kind of like that, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's working very indirectly. It's not like painting where you put paint where you want it and then you're done. Uh, you, have to, you have to work with it and ask it and you have to know how to ask it. That's like years of, of learning right there. And then you have to fire it where it might explode. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of variables, a lot of chance involved. And I think that's really exciting. But, I'll talk some more about that sort of um, riding the waves process in a couple of minutes. Um, so what I was saying was this, this functional work really does line up with my overall aesthetic. Uh, so there's the way I'm working with the glaze, but there's also, um, there's a close up of one of them. Here is uh, some cups I make that go with those. Um, this, exterior is what the back of the plates look like as well. Uh, and this is, this texture comes from uh, shells of walnuts from my backyard that I roll over the damp clay uh, and then coat it in iron oxide so that those uh, valleys are sort of highlighted with more iron. Um, so this is the close up of the plates where you can see that the edge is actually torn. It's not, a, it's not a hard edge. It's a rough, literally torn edge of the plates. And the glaze kind of lines up right on that edge where it's the gritty part uh, and then the smooth part of the plate. So this, this meeting of, of these two elements is really the primary of these. Another fun little piece I like to make sometimes. I do these a lot of times with students when we're first doing uh, pinch pots, because these are really nothing more than two pinch pots stuck together with a little tube put on top, and they're cute little bases to give away. Uh, but this is also another good example. If you look at the texture in the glaze here, this is that same glaze, just applied with a, um, a squirt bottle. So I can manage to get these sort of uncontrived looking stripes out of it, or spirals. Can you guys see that here? I don't know if, if the picture will come through that well. No. Okay. Well, moving on. Uh, so then on to more sculptural work. This is an early piece I did and it's still one of my old favorites. It's called Human Resources. It's like a filing cabinet full of people, but it's a vessel at the same time. Um, and I think this is the first time I used that glaze that's purportedly one of Ruth's. Uh, I talk to Ruth sometimes while I'm working. She's like my imaginary friend in art my wise older sister or bossy grandma maybe, I'm not sure. Um, I like that refined edge and I like that torn piece. Uh, it's that simplicity that thrills me. 
here, um, there's a couple of these that I was right. I worked in a series of these for a while. These are the two decent images I have. Um, this was made in a bowl. And talk about using the nature of clay to form the piece. I literally was taking chunks of clay and just pushing them onto the body, letting it dry a little bit, pushing it up in the bowl, adding more, pushing it up so that eventually it started coming out of the bowl and curling around. So uh, this part, uh, as I'm adding to this side and pushing the bowl down, this piece is following the curve of the bowl and coming up. So it was really precarious because there's no um, armature or structural support here. It was all based on how dry the clay was, at what point it was in the construction. Uh, this piece was created the same way. So the back, beautifully flat and smooth. The front, uh, so much evidence of hand. It was just, you know, fingerprints and thumbprints and rough and gestural and you could feel the way it was pushing. Uh, and those are fairly sizable pieces. They're probably, oh, I'd say, three feet in diameter across the circle. Evidence of hand is also a big, a big thing in my work. Um, I like, I like uh, not just showing the character of the medium itself, but my relationship with it, my presence in the process. So the fingerprints are really important. In this case, I was literally tearing clay and winding it around itself. All these edges are the natural torn edge that you find as you let clay dry a little bit and then sort of rip it off. Each one of these is a foot to a foot and a half, each circle piece. Uh, here's another version of it. And while you can see the construction process of them, especially on this second piece, um, it's less apparent on the exterior of this piece. It's more apparent on the interior where you can see little crevices forming and cracks uh, that sort of pull you in and make you want to explore inside of that. On this piece, in fact, um, there are points where if your hand is inside, you can feel where my fingers were moving it while it was still wet. It's kind of fun. It's, it's almost like it's got handles on the inside. My, uh, my brother, incidentally, uh, did not like the fact that these were untitled, like certain gallery coordinators I know. Uh, so this series, my bratty little brother titled Traffic Nibbles, because he's my little brother. Uh, well, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to stop and ask you a question. A couple yeah. people have asked this, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, people are, are interested in the time that it takes to create these pieces. And I'm sure it depends on the piece, but if you could just give a, like, a little bit about process and what it means to work with dry clay and wet clay. And, um, you know, if it's a, a couple people asked about your, they've been to your website and asked about your metal pieces and sort of what it, the, sort of what's the, what's your, when you're going in and you're working on one of these, what, what kind of time are we, you know, what, what kind of time is put into pieces? And I know that's a really difficult question to answer. Yeah, well, it is, it is and it isn't. It takes a long time. <laughs> that's, the, that's the easy answer. Um, but it takes a long time at different points. Like uh, clay, like you can do different things with clay at different points of dryness. So you're constantly babysitting it and monitoring its moisture content and the evenness of drying. Um, so I would, you know, maybe spend an hour or two working on it and then put it away for a couple days and then pull it out again and keep working on it because I need it to be at this state when I do this and I need it to be at this state when I do the next thing. So um, a piece like this, uh, I would say active working time, like actual hands-on working time for one piece, one of these circles would be a couple hours, not including glaze like just the formation of it. But those lines. That's, enjoy, sorry, yeah, okay. that's when I already know what I'm doing. There's the countless hours that go into figuring out the system for when I have to do what and all the failures beforehand because there's so many. And here's a question along those lines. It, how, how are those failures for your fawn? Because the question is, would you say you enjoy the process or the finished work? Like what are you just like, 
thank God this damn thing is done? Or do you like the process of swearing oh, and throwing oh, it at the wall? Process, like, like, where are you? The pro totally, yes process? Totally a process, girl. Okay. The end result is for other people. Like, uh, it's it's almost like the, the, the debris that's left from my fun. <laughs> other people value that stuff. I value the making, honestly. I just love it. I love being messy. I love finding new ways of doing stuff. And I, everything I do with clay, it's, it's a matter of uh, learning more about it. It's a learning process. And I, I learn by pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until it collapses, until it fails miserably. Then I do it again and I pull back just before the collapse because that's where the interesting stuff is. That's where it's exciting on that, that precipice of what's possible and what isn't and what the, the characteristics and capabilities of a medium are. Otherwise, you know, anybody could do that, you know? Uh, yeah, so I'm definitely a process person. I'm curious about your, uh, <laughs> and so are, it looks like a few other people, um, how you said the rest is for everyone. You lost me. You said you're, you said the rest is for everyone else. Um, I'm sorry, you cut out, and all I heard you say was, "I'm curious." I'm just generally a curious person. It's true. Um, uh, and the rest is for everyone else. So if yeah, you could give me that middle part again. That's all it was. I was curious about what that means for you in terms oh, of. Um, well, the artwork that you make, you put it out into the world, and you put it on a wall, and people look at it, but they don't know how you made it. So. Yeah, um, uh, well, you know, there's value put on art that is somewhat irrational, I think, at times. Um, you know, people will pay a bazillion dollars for something that may be no more or less valuable than what I'm making when the value is in the making. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'd like to sell a ton of work, but I'm going to make it whether I sell it or not, because that's, that's my part. Uh, someone else's part to buy it if they want to do that awesome if not uh, whatever man <laughs> do you have what do you want people to get from uh, looking at your work that's such a great question I honestly I have to not care in a lot of ways I have to keep myself from caring um, we're kind of running low on time so oh oh here's another piece of evidence of hand ah uh, right the, the airbrush, I mean, that is a handprint that's what, like 17, 20,000 years old? That artist got his hand in there. We, his hand, his actual hand is there. That's so exciting. Okay, uh, back to your question, Juan. Um, I'm going to skip around a bit since we're yeah, there. Like, well, I'll send you these questions later if you want to answer cool. them. You don't have to, but like, man, we got a philosophical group here. Some of these questions are like, you could, like they're just awesome. You guys have really good questions. Deep, 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 philosophical question. So you can answer Juan's and Juan, Juan, throw out any other ones that you want. Okay. Um, so for me, I like art. I, of course, I want everyone to, to get from art what I do, right? Uh, when I look at art, I want it, I want it not to be too topical. I want to be able to appreciate it uh, from a, almost a meditative state or sense. And I want to be able to see it completely differently, almost like a book. Now, compared to 20 years when I look at it again, I want it to change with me. Um, but I know that's not how many or most people look at art. So I have to like, because they put their own business on my art. Uh, I, I teach a humanities class and I don't get to write it. And one of the questions they get asked is, you know, what is art? And everyone comes back with these answers like, well, my definition of art is blank. And, you know, as the person who's making the art, I'm like, well, I don't care what your definition of my art is. Your interpretation of what I'm making is so utterly irrelevant, I can't even believe it. Um, so I, like, pull back. I don't let myself engage in that way because um, even if I'm doing something with content, like this piece I have up in, um, with a lot of like actual like specific content. Um, this one was Hey Daddy and I, I kind of set out to, you know, like, Hey Daddy, um, set out to instigate my father a little bit because he's so very different than me.
like my mom was a crazy hippie and my dad was this like button down Republican finance guy. Uh, and he's super conservative. And yet, he, like we don't get along in many ways, but in some ways he really surprises me. Some of the stuff he would have read in grad school, which led me to read uh, some work by Andrew Carnegie on philanthropy, uh, which is where this piece came from. And I actually included the, the passage here. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but it's like his, his thoughts on the duty of a man of wealth, right? And all the, the lighter colored stuff is all about, um, you know, good things that you should be doing with his money and helping and whatever. But then it ends with, the man of thus becoming the mere trustee and agent for his poorer brethren, bring to their service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability to administer, doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves. Uh, and I read that and I was like, screw you, man. You're talking about me and you are not wiser, you are not superior, and you have nothing to do with my world experience. Get out of here, man. Uh, and so this piece I made, um, has that passage literally written in bleach or in a caustic substance in front of this piece, which is uh, the white bits are porcelain. Uh, and I chose that because porcelain is like kind of thought of as like an old timey grandma fine, you know, rich, you know, kind of uh, cultural item, but then done in a really rough sort of unrefined way and strapped in with these rough ropes. Um, so it's a really dark sardonic piece to me and I, I showed this once and I think three people came up to me um, and you know I'm hoping to sell a piece of art and uh, close up uh, they're like, oh my god I just love your piece it's so happy it's so beachy it's just wonderful you know and what do you say to that like and I, I even if you're up here and the exploration that's what like of the piece right there so when you asked me how I want other people to see my art like um, like I do. <laughs> Is I that say, a good tell answer? Them, tell that, them to read the labels, um, right? Tell them to read the labels on the walls. That's that's what they should be doing. Yeah, but um, you know, if it's someone that might buy something, it's kind of like, yeah, it's totally beachy. Like, <laughs> it depends on how hungry you are, really. Right. I want to ask one last question. And if Vaughn has like one or two more things she wants to show, and I would like you to hop in on this one too, Juan. Um, a couple people asked similar type things where um, do you have any advice for aspiring artists or what's your opinion on people who judge people who choose art as a career or an art degree like you know we got you know, we're not all art student you know not everybody who takes my classes is gonna go into art but what is your advice for um, aspiring artists or you know what do you say about you know the people who question art as a profession or a career path right right now. And I, I mean, Juan, I think you, Juan is also um, a practicing artist. And so if you guys both want to chime in, I think this would be a good way to, to you know, bring, bring it home. So I'm going to- I'll lead it off uh, with uh, a little bit um, about the idea of what do people, what do you say to people who, who judge your career choices, oh. right? Yeah. So as an artist, as I mean, we talked about you adjuncting at four different schools and many, many classes. Um, and there's a certain amount of perseverance that's involved with being an artist, right? A certain amount of like, I think you kind of answered this question a little bit, the whole not caring thing, because you're going to make something no matter what people think of it. Um, I think that's a big part of it. And the failure part that you mentioned is also a big part of it. As artists, we fail every day, all the time. And what what you guys see as art people who as uh, viewers of art or someone who goes to a show, you're seeing the one, maybe two successes that we have had in quite a long time. Um, so when you see someone's retrospective show or a huge show from a singular person, what you're seeing is the culmination of many many hours of failure and a few minutes of success. Um, so I think that's what's really great about Fawn is um, her work, it pretends to be like very, as I think you said, elemental. It pretends to be simple, um, yeah. but yet it's very complex in the way it's made because of her process. Because she puts so much into the process, it gets complex and complex, but then it looks very simple. That's something very, very hard to do. Yeah. Um, but 
I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish it up. Yeah, I mean, failure is really important. Um, and just accepting it. And is my career exactly where I want it right now? Not really. Uh, but I'm really happy I'm not working in an office anymore. Uh, I'm really happy. This piece, I pulled this up. It's one of my favorite pieces I ever made. It's called Upon the Foundation of Me. And it really came from the notion that I didn't want to be a tool of someone else's dreams anymore. I wanted to work on my own ideas. Um, and this piece, I'll talk about this one piece as quickly. Um, see the white things? That started as a square of flat pieces with an open hole about this big in the middle. But knowing how my clay uh, gives in a fire as it gets softer and knowing the properties of two metal armatures and the melting temperature, uh, I controlled the melt of this so that it came down in the center and formed this interesting organic shape. So how did I know it would happen? Because I totally screwed up one time and then I followed that mistake and did it over and over and over again until it becomes reliable and I can sort of control it. And I love that serendipity, that give and take with the medium and the, the equipment I'm using. Um, I would love to be teaching full time. And honestly, when I went to grad school, I didn't think I'd be teaching. That wasn't my goal. Uh, but I needed some money and I did some teaching and I gotta be honest, I really love teaching. It's so fun and uh, different and I get to meet people, not like acquaintance wise, but like we're working together. Like I'm not good, like in a gallery setting, like schmoozing and shaking hands and small talk and all that nonsense. I'm really good at working side by side by people. And that's the way I for studio setting is really fulfilling, especially with clay, because everyone walks in, it's like, oh, I want to throw on the wheel like they do with the videos. <laughs> and they, when they get their first cylinder and, and mug and they're so happy with it, it's just, it's really wonderful. So um, be open and be, as far as career advice, if you wanted to get into this, you got to be ready to do a ton of different stuff. Yeah. Um, teaching, making art, uh, you, one of you was saying that you were shocked at the number of different types of art I have on my website. Um, you got to do different stuff. Um, it's all over the place. Uh, I teach, I was on the arts council. Uh, you got to have like many streams of income because one or more is always falling off, I guess. Well, Fawn, um, thank you for spending some time with us and dropping some knowledge about your art. Um, I wish you uh, good luck with making more of it. I wanna see more of it, honestly. Um, and what we'll do uh, is we'll make sure if, um, if you ask the question, I think Amy had already addressed it, she'll get the copy of the transcript so you guys can get your credit you deserve. Okay, wait. Uh, hmm? What's that? I can't wait. Yeah, you'll get your credit too, Fawn. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, all right, and so I think we're gonna wrap it here, but um, just keep an eye out. We'll post a video link um, as soon as we get it. Uh, I'll edit it and put together. Thank you all for your questions and your patience. And um, you know, these Zoom meetings can be kind of tiresome, so I really appreciate everyone stopping by and. I will let you know when we get um, a, a finalized list of times for our next artists. And there's going to be some really interesting work, um, especially when we get close to election time. So uh, just uh, <laughs> keep a uh, keep an eye out for it. And I think we are done for now. So uh, thank you all. Thanks, all you guys for coming. And thank you for asking questions. It's always easier yeah. when people are involved. I, I really appreciated your involvement. I'm so. lucky to have great students this semester.